Okay. So we are going to start with chapter 22 on nutrition and the later chapter 23 on the urinary system. Uh, and the nutrition, like I said, will be a lot of review. And the good thing about that is the material that I'm going to be reviewing, the material that you're going to hear me talk about, the material that I'm going to stress is the stuff that you're going to see on the test uh, or on a quiz based on that. So uh, that'll, that'll make it a little bit easier you'll hear this stuff at least this will be at least the second time, maybe even the third time you've heard some of these things. But we are going to start that now. So here we go. Oh, so you should be able to see my screen right, right about now. and metabolism. So why do we eat? What's the purpose of eating? I don't say to live. It's a little too vague. Uh, the reason we eat is to get the nutrients. That's the purpose of eating, to get nutrients. And we get those nutrients so that we can deliver them to our cells and we can uh, utilize those nutrients to make, well, energy and to make proteins. Because you know, that's really what we do more than anything else, to make energy and make proteins. So, here. let's dive into this chapter. Notice with malnutrition, with the definition here, deficiency. I'm sorry, do you have a question? I couldn't hear that. No, I'm sorry. Okay. Notice in the definition of malnutrition, deficiency or imbalance in the consumption of food. A lot of people, when they hear the word malnutrition, they automatically assume that uh, it is a deficiency in food. But if you look at places like the United States, where we have just an enormous amount of food, and a lot of it isn't necessarily healthy. A lot of it is that stuff we can get through a drive through restaurant. And it's the, the uh, nutritional content that's not the right term. The nutritional value of the food is equivalent to eating chocolate cake. There's a lot of bad stuff and a very small amount of good stuff in it. So we can see people who are, well, appear to be well-fed, we'll put it that way, but they're not healthy because of this imbalance in the consumption of their food. So it's a good thing to kind of consider when you hear the term malnutrition. It doesn't just mean that they don't have access to food. A lot of times it's the choices that are made. All right. Now, when it comes to macromolecules of nutrition and micromolecules of nutrition, I keep all the minerals uh, into the category of micromolecules of nutrition, and I stick with the basic ones here under what they call macronutrients. Uh, I call macromolecules, uh, but meaning either way that these are things that we need a lot of. And I don't include water in this category. And the reason for that is because water has its unique thing that it does. Remember, water can do that osmosis thing, the passive movement of, across a selectively permeable membrane from an area of low solid concentration or high solid concentration. So I put water in its own separate category. Uh, it's not that I don't recognize it as a, a molecule that we do a lot of, but 
It's just unique in and of itself. Then, of course, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. I think everybody agrees upon these fall under the macro molecules or macronutrients. Need lots of those. The problem with looking at the micronutrients, we need these in small amounts, doesn't necessarily make them any less important. Uh, maybe, maybe only slightly less important uh, because we do need those things like sugar, the fuel. I'm some cool bed to go help her. Did she like, please come? That's why I got in the shower, but then when I went, yeah. what's the bonus? She was like, no, I'm like, going like, to be on. I can't get the phone now. Your I'm microphone. In the shower just in case. Who gives her bonus? I can't leave this room. Mike, hello. Like, your plug it up. On, I just plug it up and leave it running like I'm on. Okay. And I get Mark for me in there and I can watch this tonight on YouTube. You don't smoke in the morning. There we go. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay, so we'll move on there. Oh, actually, uh, the minerals. Yeah, these are these are some are going to be really, really familiar to you. Uh, you're going to hear about things like iron. And you've heard about iron in the past, and you know that iron is really important. We need iron in that hemoglobin molecule in order to transport oxygen. But there's other minerals that we have in our body that you might not be as aware of. So those will be kind of interesting coming up. Metabolism. We've talked about metabolism way back in the week two, I think, or three, maybe. Uh, we talked about metabolism, and we I included. Uh, a definition of metabolism that I kind of want you to understand more than just memorize. This is why I had the drawing of the automobile with the engine utilizing those things coming in, things like the fuel as glucose and then oxygen and water. And then the more of those come in, the faster we can run our engine. Uh, but we're also going to create waste products. And we're also going to create heat. And I said to you, the reason why I spend so much time on the definition of metabolism is because we're going to see it over and over and over again. And we are going to talk about the importance of getting these things into our body and into our cells, that glucose, oxygen, and water, so that the machinery can run like it's supposed to. So metabolism, even though it seems like a simple definition, or somewhat simple definition. Uh, it is something that you really do need to understand a little bit, at least have an overview of an understanding of what is happening in our bodies so that you realize if we're putting more and more fuel in, we'll be able to run things faster. If we are deficient in those fuels, Machinery won't be able to run as it's supposed to. Things are going to slow down or eventually even stop. So it's kind of a, it's a big part of medicine, learning about metabolism. So yeah, all, all these chemical processes that are occurring in our cells uh, every single day, every minute, every moment of every single day, Utilizing these fuel sources, these things like glucose, oxygen, and water to make those very important energy. Uh, and then, of course, to make proteins, those components of the cell that are really, really important. We also talked about the plasma membrane or the cell membrane, having to get things into the cell. Is, a, is extremely important because that's where everything is happening. So when these things get into the cell and they're utilized in those biochemical processes, 
We call that assimilation. That's the term that you see here. When nutrient molecules enter cells and undergo changes. Then we talked about catabolism and anabolism a long time ago. Catabolism is the breakdown of something. Anabolism is the building up of something. Uh, and again, this goes back to week two or week three when we talked about metabolism. And then we talked about proteins. And I said, in building up proteins, we use those building blocks, those amino acids. And that is called when we're building things up, we call that anabolism. And then when we're breaking them back down again, we call that catabolism. And that these two things can be working like at the same time, we could be breaking something down as we're building something up. And I believe the example I used was like with Lego blocks. As you have something built, you can take the blocks apart, break them down, and then build up something else. And finally, ATP, finally on this slide, adenosine triphosphate. This is the molecule that we want to make. This is the molecule that we use as an energy source. And what we do is we make this molecule and then we use it. And then we make it and then we use it. And we make it, we use it, we make it, use it, 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 make it, use it. That's what we're doing all day and night ever since we started out as a single cell. When we were brand, brand, brand new, all we've been doing, well, most all what we've been doing is making and using ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So here's that representation of that molecule. Notice the A, that's the adenosine. And then we have three inorganic phosphates bound to it. There's one close to it, then there's a middle one, then there's a furthest phosphate. That bond between the middle and the furthest phosphate is the highest energy bond. So when we break that bond right here, when we break that off and release that inorganic phosphate, that is what gives us energy. That releases the energy. And now we'll end up with adenosine diphosphate, ADP, plus a free inorganic phosphate. So what do we want to do? Well, we want that to be ATP again, so we build it back up. And you'll notice they're showing here as we're building up that molecule, we're using energy. As we break it apart, we release energy. As we build it up, we use energy. So energy is required in the process of making energy, which I know sounds weird, However, you probably have heard in the past somebody say, it takes money to make money. So if you wanted to start a lemonade stand, you'd have to go and still purchase the lemons and the sugar and the cups and straws, I think. I don't know what else goes in the lemonade. I guess that's it. Uh, and water and find a spot and start making lemonade. And the more lemonade you sell, the more profit you make. So you still have to start out with buying some of that stuff. So it takes money to make money while it takes energy to make energy. As long as you're coming out with the profit, that's all that matters. Everything being equal, more money is always better. All right, starting with some of these macromolecules, we got carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are not 
innately fattening. People think carbohydrates are what make you fat. That is not true at all. Carbohydrates are incredibly important. Carbohydrates are required. They're something that we need. About 65% of your diet should be made up of carbohydrates. Then why do people think that they make you fat? Well, one, they, they don't have a clear understanding. But two, the problem is the overconsumption of carbohydrates is what makes people fat. And people put a lot more carbohydrates in their body than they realize. So that's when it becomes a problem. But what is a carbohydrate? It's really just a whole bunch of sugar molecules stuck together in a long branched chain. That's about it. A bunch of sugars. Saccharides, if you will. The simplest are the monosaccharides like glucose or fructose or galactose. These are monosaccharides, single sugars. If we get a couple of those single sugars and we stick them together, like we take a glucose and a fructose and snap them together, now we have a disaccharide. In that case, we have sucrose, table sugar. Or if we took glucose and galactose and stuck them together, now we have a disaccharide. In this case, we have lactose. Or we just get a whole bunch of them, stick them together in a long branch chain, and now we have a polysaccharide, many sugars all stuck together. Cellulose is a, a plant component. This is something we can't break down, but it is a component of fiber. You've probably heard about fiber and having fiber in your diet. Having fiber in your diet is important. The reason for that is because it helps to attract water. It also helps to get rid of some excess fats like with cholesterol, people have high cholesterol. Good thing to do. But it continues through, because remember, if we can't break something down, if we can't absorb something, it just keeps going through. So those carbohydrate molecules come in, we break them apart, break them into their individual components. Then we'll take the individual sugars if we need to. We can put those directly into blood. And now we can maintain that certain amount of sugar, that certain amount of glucose we want to keep in our blood. Or we can put it into quick storage form. We call like uh, glycogen, excuse me. So you can save it for later. If you have to eventually, you might put it in a long-term storage. That's fat. But we know that we want to have glucose in the blood. Remember, glucose is what I call cell sugar. Everyone else calls it blood sugar. The problem with that is it's found in places other than the blood. Blood, of course, is mainly for transporting things around. And we do keep a certain amount of glucose in our blood. But we keep it there so that we can transport it to where it needs to go quickly. But where it needs to be, where we want it to be, where it does its job, is inside of the cells. That's where we want to have that glucose. We want to get it 
into the cell. So I don't call it blood sugar because we don't just want it in the blood. We want it to be going into the cells that need it for cell sugar, I think is a more appropriate name. Problem, of course, is that glucose is a big molecule and it doesn't know where to go and it can't just slide through a membrane of a cell. So it has to be taken to a cell and then there has to be a door that is opened so that it can move on in. And of course, the delivery guy glucose is named insulin, takes glucose by the hand and says, come with me, I know where you need to go. Plus, I got the code to open up the door. And you've heard this before a little bit. And you remember I told you that glucose is like the fuel that we use to create the energy, just the same way we use coal to burn, to eventually create energy and energy plants. But the problem with that description is it's a little simplified because yes we want to get glucose inside of the cell and yes the mitochondria is going to make the atp however what we need to do before it goes into the mitochondria while it's still in the cell uh, cytoplasm we need to break down glucose into two molecules of pyruvate, although you'll see it as pyruvic acid. Glucose is a six carbon sugar. What we wanna do is we wanna create two three carbon molecules called pyruvate. And the pyruvate will then be in the, go to the mitochondria, where it will go through some more biochemical processes to eventually create ATP, to eventually create energy. And what they're showing here uh, with glucose having to be phosphorylated, glucose 6 uh, phosphate, is just one step in glycolysis. And believe me, there are several steps um, with several enzymes involved. This is uh, what I sent to you. Well, no, I didn't send it to you, excuse me. This is what I posted in the announcement, uh, an image of glycolysis. And it shows the several steps involved and the enzymes all involved to take one glucose molecule and then change it first as it says here into glucose 6-phosphate uh, but then that has to be changed to fructose 6-phosphate which then gets changed to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate this all is happening through very unique enzymes uh, there are several more steps involved about six more steps involved until it eventually becomes those two pyruvate molecules that we need. And that is what we're seeing here. So this step here, this anaerobic step is occurring in the cytoplasm of the cell, starting at the top with the glucose molecule. There's a little bit of energy that, uh, that is created in this pathway down to pyruvate. But what they don't show is there's also energy that is required in this pathway down to pyruvate. So, because again, we have to use, we have to use energy to make energy. So what looks very, very simple here, take one glucose and just split it in half and you have a six carbon uh, molecule that becomes two three carbon molecules. Two of those pyruvates, or as they call it, pyruvic acid. That's the same thing, by the way. If you hear me call it pyruvate, pyruvic acid is the same thing. 
there's actually about 10 steps involved in this one little part right here. Again, this is why I put it in the announcements uh, so that you can see the image and see all of the different enzymes that are involved which means if there is a problem with any of these enzymes in each one of these steps, then it can't get down to this next part of being pyruvic acid or py uh, pyruvate. Then as you see, as we're going into the mitochondrion, we take those pyruvates and we have to change them and then they go through another big biochemical step. I think we, we did talk about this before, the citric acid cycle, although you'll hear me call it the Krebs cycle, or I think an older one is the tricarboxylic acid cycle, the TCA cycle. But this is a process where more components are created to make more and more ATP, make more and more energy. So this is the complicated biochemistry part made to look really, really, really easy. Make it look really simple. And well, it is not. So glycolysis, as we saw there, is that the process of taking glucose and breaking it down to the pyruvate. The citric acid cycle is going to carry on with more biochemistry. This is the part that's occurring in the mitochondrion, and the components from that are going to be used in what you see right here. So this is taking place in the mitochondrion. Remember, the mitochondria have two membranes. They have an inner membrane and an outer membrane. This process is taking place on the inner membrane. And it starts way up here with things that are coming from the citric acid cycle, the thing we just saw. This is called the electron transport chain. You can see there, these complexes are numbered here, it goes through. And there are some a uh, couple of things that are missing as well. They're, they're trying to simplify it a little bit. But one thing that you might notice, other than that there's electrons, those are the E's with a negative sign, the charge, going from one to the next to the next to the next complex. One thing that you might notice is we have hydrogens getting pushed across that inner membrane. So they're ending up in that space in between the inner membrane and the outer membrane. Well, what is that for? Why are we pushing all these hydrogens over there? They are going to make their way to this protein here, ATP synthase. And they're going to shoot through this type of a special protein channel. And as they shoot through, that causes ADP, adenosine diphosphate, plus their inorganic phosphate, to join up and create ATP. And you'll notice water is also created here as a byproduct. So the way that I can sort of imagine this. If I think of ATP synthase as a sliding board, a big tall sliding board, and the protons, the hydrogen ions lining up like children uh, coming in a, to the ladder of the long sliding board and climbing their way up and then just sort of lining up behind one another. And as they slide down, they create this energy. Uh, well, in this case, of course, creating ATP. So the process is going to require that the protons go back in between the membranes, the hydrogen ions, 
Remember, those are synonymous. They're going to move back between that in that space between the two membranes, wait in line, climb up the ladder, zip on through or zip on down the slide, in this case, going through the ATP synthase. And as they do that, energy is created. There is uh, not a simple way to describe this. The only thing I did is about as simply as I can, because this is a bit complex, as you can see here. Well, several complexes, but it's a bit complex. Remember, all of this started out with glucose. That glucose molecule is going to be what eventually is going to help us make these things here. NADH2 and FADH2, which is then going to uh, spark this train, this um, chain of electrons moving down this, these complexes and pushing protons across that inner membrane into the space between the two membranes. That's what I just said, okay. And that, I think that's mostly what I said. All right, control of glucose metabolism. We discussed this in the endocrine system, uh, how we have hormones like glucagon and insulin, cortisol, that are going to help sort of determine how much sugar should be in the blood at any given time. And when you see these terms, hyperglycemic and hypoglycemic, you should have no problem breaking them down. Remember, emia means in the blood. Glyco means sugar, and hyper is above or more than normal, and hypo is below or deficient. So you should be able to see these terms and quickly break them down in your head and know that they're talking about high blood sugar and low blood sugar. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to worry for right now. I'm not going to worry about uh, some of these releasing hormones. We're just going to look at these here. If you recall from the endocrine system, glucagon Glucagon is released from the alpha cells in the pancreas. And its job is to get that glucose out of the quick storage form from the glycogen back into glucose so they can go you know, back in the blood. That's the idea, at least, to in, there, thereby increasing blood sugar. Now, if you follow the logic on growth hormone, growth hormone, as I said, back in the endocrine system, will eventually cause anything capable of growing to grow. Now remember, there's a, another step in between, but eventually growth hormone will cause any cell that's capable of growing, any tissue capable of growing to grow. In order to grow, we need things like energy and proteins. And in order to make energy, we need glucose as well as oxygen and water. 
So of course, if growth hormone is released, that means things are going to be growing. If things are going to be growing, well, then we're going to have to use some of that sugar. So we have to put that glucose into the blood. So it kind of makes sense that if growth hormone is on the rise, then we're going to need to have more blood sugar, more cell sugar, more of that glucose ready to be mobilized. And you can almost think of the same with epinephrine, the same sort of logic. When there's a need for more blood sugar, body's going to put more of that glucose in the blood to get it to the cells to make more energy. And epinephrine is often referred to as adrenaline. Remember, this is something that is released uh, during times of fight or flight, sympathetic division of the um, the sympathetic division of the peripheral nervous system. Jeez, that's the perimeter. So when you're ready to fight or flight, you got to put up your dukes or run away, which means you're going to be using a lot of energy, which means you're going to require a lot of energy, which means you better make a lot of energy. Of course, we're going to be making more energy. We're going to need more fuel. So the body says, put more of that glucose, get it ready to, to be in the blood to get it to the cells. So it kind of makes sense that when you go into fight or flight mode, you're gonna need more energy and you're gonna need more fuel. And we talked about the glucocorticoids, uh, the one that I think I mentioned the most is cortisol. Cortisol is a unique type of a steroid hormone in, the, in that it can move across the cell membranes just like other steroid hormones do, but it does not go directly to the nucleus. It has to uh, first meet its partner in the cytoplasm, but I digress. Cortisol is that hormone that's gonna help determine how much sugar should be in the blood at any given time and where it should be stored otherwise. So that one's a little more complicated. But all these are going to make sure there's more sugar ready to go. So what's going to lower blood sugar? Well, our delivery guys. Remember, that's what delivery guys do. Delivery guys deliver things. So they're going to deliver glucose where it needs to go, the cells that are waiting for it, as well as cells that are storage cells. So it's going to take that glucose and deliver it somewhere, but it's going to take it out of the blood and move it into cells, which is going to lower the overall blood glucose. Kind of makes sense. Lipids are fats. Lipids are fats. And they're considered more of the liquidy fats. When we talk about adipose tissue being fat, that's more of a collection of fat in the cells. Lipids, like triglycerides, the ones that we have seen the, the molecule of with the glycerol backbone and then the three fatty acid chains coming off of it. There's long chains of carbons with hydrogen stuck to them. And if all of the carbons are completely saturated with hydrogens, in other words, there's no more room for any more hydrogen stuck to them, we call those saturated fats. And saturated fats are, of course, 
solid at room temperature. They form nice straight lines in those chains. If there are spaces where there aren't hydrogens on those long chains, then the carbon molecules create double bonds between them, between themselves. That creates kinks in the molecule. And because there are kinks in the molecule, they don't stack very well, which is why those unsaturated fats are fluid at room temperature. I think we talked about that again a couple of weeks ago. Phospholipids we talked about in those cell membranes. Those are the molecules that look like little hairpins. There's uh, an inner layer and then an outer layer. creating that cell membrane, that bilipid membrane. And another component that helps to strengthen or complete, I should say, that cell membrane is cholesterol. So for people who think cholesterol is bad for you, cholesterol is not bad for you. We need cholesterol. We need cholesterol to make those cell membranes, and we need cholesterol to make those hormones, specifically the steroid hormones. So if we need it, our bodies make it. So when we look at somebody's total cholesterol in their body, most of that is cholesterol that we created. Very little of your overall cholesterol is actually dietary cholesterol. In other words, very little of your, the total cholesterol that's in your body right now came from your diet. Most of it came from your body making cholesterol. So what that means is when people have high cholesterol, it's not because they eat a lot of foods that are high in cholesterol. It's because their body's making too much of it. That's why we give them those medications that specifically slow down that process of creating cholesterol so they don't make as much of it. Those are medications we refer to as the statin drugs, things like Lipitor. They don't get rid of cholesterol. They just make the, have the body make less of it. They interrupt the rate limiting step of cholesterol synthesis, which is something called HMG CoA reductase. They inhibit that enzyme. All right, moving fats around. One carrier, something called chylomicrons help to carry fats around. But the one that I want you to really know about are the lipoproteins. I want you to know about these because there's two main types. There are high density lipoproteins and low density lipoproteins, which are often referred to as HDL and LDL respectively. High density lipoproteins are the good transporters. We want more of those. Those are the ones that take cholesterol and bring it to where we need it. Low density lipoproteins, LDLs, those are the bad transporters. They take that cholesterol and drop it off on the side of the road, or in this case, on the side of the arteries, creating those fatty streaks eventual cholesterol plaques. So when people talk about good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, 
that's not really accurate because cholesterol is cholesterol. It is neither good nor bad. However, these transporters, these trucks that carry it around, they, these are the ones that can be good or bad. Good transporters, bad transporters. HDLs, high density lipoproteins, are the good transporters. LDLs, low density lipoproteins, are the bad transporters. We wanna make more of the good ones, and by default, we'll make less of the bad ones. If we're making more good ones, we won't have enough parts left over to make more bad ones. So it's actually pretty simple. Unfortunately, when I say it's simple to make more HDLs, I mean, it's simple. All we have to do is eat healthy and exercise. That's simple. Now, whether people want to eat healthy and exercise, that's a different story. But lots of fresh fruits, and especially fresh vegetables and exercise will contribute greatly to the production of those good transporters, the HDLs. So again, I stress this one because this is what you hear about the most. You hear people calling them good cholesterols and bad cholesterols, but they are not good or bad. They are the trucks that are transporting it around. Those are the good and bad things. And if somebody is making a lot of cholesterol, we will encourage them to eat a low fat diet because you know, if they're bringing in more fats, that will actually help in production of more cholesterol. So if we minimize the amount of fats they're bringing in, that'll help them make less cholesterol as well. And then the, the simplest component, the fatty acids, can be free floating, which can, of course, then be utilized by other cells. All we have to do is float them from one place to another. So that's kind of uh, the simplest form. But of these, of these three, the lipoproteins are the ones that I definitely want you to know about the most because like I said, they're kind of important. Breaking down and uh, building up fats. Again, follows the same concept of anabolism and catabolism. And you'll notice that the hormones that are involved in this are some of the same hormones that we just saw. ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone, of course, is going to act on uh, the adrenal glands, the cortex. which goes back to things like glucocorticoids uh, and mineral corticoids. That takes us to proteins. Now, proteins, do we need them? Absolutely. How important are they? Well, we make two things more than anything else. We make energy and we make proteins. Those are the two things that we do and have been doing since we were a single cell. More than anything else, we make energy and we make proteins. Proteins are made up of amino acids. Those are the little Lego blocks, the building blocks that build up proteins. We snap them together and make the proteins that we need, whether they are uh, structural proteins or enzymes. We are going to take these individual Lego blocks called amino acids and snap them together into how, in the format that we need them at any given time. You'll notice here, 
only about half of the required types of amino acids can be made by the body, the rest are supplied through diet. This is where you'll hear the terms essential amino acids and non-essential amino acids. And the terminology confuses people because if you hear that these amino acids are essential amino acids, that makes it sound like those are important ones. And if I say these other amino acids are non-essential amino acids, well, that makes it sound like, yeah, they're not as important, but that's not true at all. The definitions for essential versus non-essential in this case is that essential amino acids must be coming in from your diet. The non-essential amino acids are amino acids that our body creates. They're just as important. Just because they're called non-essential doesn't mean they're not important. They're just as important. But, but the difference is our body can create them. The essential amino acids are the ones that have to come in through the diet. Now, the problem with this is that we can take some essential amino acids, in other words, that we've brought in from the foods that we eat, and we can use those to create other amino acids, meaning those other amino acids are non-essential. But what if we don't take those amino acids in from our diet to begin with? Well, then we can't make the other type. Let me show you what I mean. I think I, I can demonstrate a little easier this way. So here uh, we have an essential amino acid. And we'll just draw this essential amino acid as a black square. So we eat this, this food that contains this essential amino acid. And we utilize that to make this, I'm going to call it a non-essential amino acid. So this one, our body makes. This one, essential from our foods. So in some cases, we'll take an essential amino acid and use that to create another type of amino acid inside of the body. But now that is considered a non-essential amino acid. Doesn't mean it's not important. It just means that we're creating that one. But if for some reason we can't get this one into our body, then uh, sir? yes. Yeah, um, if we can't get that one in, do um, is there like some sort of buildup or something? Yes, that's an interesting question. Yes, there is. Because in this, in a case, where let's say this essential amino acid, uh, let's give you an example here, phenylalanine. Phenylalanine is an essential amino acid that we get from our food. Hold on one second. Uh, make sure. I get the enzyme correct. I think it's phenylalanine hydroxylase that converts it to tyrosine. Let's see. 
Yeah, okay. So if this, if this essential amino acid was the amino acid called phenylalanine, and there is an essential amino acid called phenylalanine that we get in from our diet, and we convert that using an enzyme called phenylalanine hydroxylase to this amino acid called tyrosine. Tyrosine is a non-essential amino acid because our body creates it. However, if for some reason we can't take this phenylalanine and convert it because we are missing this enzyme, if this enzyme is missing, then this conversion doesn't happen, which means the phenylalanine will actually accumulate. And in children, that's going to be really bad. That is going to cause things like mental retardation, which of course we do not want to happen. Or it's going to cause, it can cause albinism. It, it also creates something that's really unique, uh, often described as a mousy odor. It's a strange way to describe how something smells, but uh, that's the description of mousy odor, like mice. But the big problem, of course, is that it's accumulating the phenylalanine since it can't convert it, and that's causing mental retardation. This is called phenylketonuria, or sometimes just called PKU. Now, the thing about phenylketonuria is that every child in the United States is tested for this when they're born. It's not that it's super common or something, uh, but if we catch it early, all we have to do is make sure the child grows up with a diet that is low in phenylalanine. And if we do that, then they won't have any problems. They won't have mental retardation, for instance. And once they're adults, they can, they can kind of, they tend to ignore the diet. It's not as important um, unless they're female and then they get pregnant, in which case they got to revert back to the strict diet again, staying away from uh, excessive phenylalanine because that can cause the child to be born mental retardation. But what that means for tyrosine is now tyrosine is going to become an essential amino acid. Because if the body can't make it, well, we're going to have to get it in some other form. So when we use these terms, essential amino acid and non-essential amino acid, it doesn't mean one is more important than the other. It just means one comes from our food and the other one we can create. And if for some reason, like in this case, we cannot um, utilize the phenylalanine, we cannot make tyrosine, then tyrosine becomes an essential amino acid. So yeah, if you, if you look up um, childhood records, every child in the United States, when they're born, gets tested for PKU, phenylketonuria. Uh, it's called the Guthrie test. Guthrie. It's really cheap. Uh, it's like a, I don't know, a $5 test. It's pretty cheap, which is good. It's inexpensive. It's easy. And if we catch it early, the kid will be fine. All we have to do is adjust their diet or make sure the parents adjust their diet, adjust the kid's diet, and the kid will be fine. Uh, but if we don't catch it and the child doesn't adjust their diet, um, they're going to end up with things like mental retardation. And again, nobody wants that.
That was a good question about the accumulation. Very nice. Okay. Let's take a pause for a moment. Does anyone else have any questions? No. Well, I'll take, I'm gonna take a quick pause right here. So I'll see you in just a moment. Be right back. Okay, so we are going to continue with the nutrition lecture. And we are going to go into a little bit of protein degradation. We'll see why that's important here in just a moment. So let's pull up that screen. And you should be able to see my screen any moment now. Right about now. There we go. Protein metabolism. Well, we know proteins are built up and broken down because they're made up of those amino acids, which again, I always liken to uh, Lego blocks. And look at the process of protein catabolism taking place in the liver. We end up with ammonia. And what we have to do is we have to get rid of that, but we are going to get rid of it in the form of urea. So we have to change that ammonia molecule into a urea molecule, which is what we're going to then move to the kidneys and filter out. So when you hear me talk earlier about getting rid of nitrogenous waste. This is that nitrogen-based waste, urea. So of course, once again, we are going to start out with one molecule and have to change another, another molecule. So there is a process, this is called the urea cycle, where we are going to convert that into several different things using several different enzymes in this pathway to eventually end up with urea that we can uh, excrete by the kidneys. And again, oops, not surprisingly, the metabolism of proteins is going to be controlled by hormones mostly. Vitamins often act as coenzymes. So remember, an enzyme is a protein that's going to catalyze a reaction. So sometimes we need these helpers. And that's sort of the best way of thinking of a coenzyme. It is going to, in some way, work with an enzyme that's going to help these biochemical pathways occur. And of course, most of these we are going to take in through our diet. There's only about five times in your life that you should be taking supplemental vitamins. And that would be when you're very young. That's why they make the Flintstone vitamins. Uh, in your elder years, like older than 65, that's why I take those one a day vitamins. If she is pregnant, that's why we make sure she gets those prenatal vitamins. If a person is specifically deficient in a vitamin, in other words, they've been tested and the doctor says, you don't have enough of this certain vitamin, so you take a supplement. Or if a person is immunocompromised. Now, immunocompromised can mean everything from having the flu or COVID-19 or HIV, or just a cold. Uh, 
boost your immune system, then you can take some extra vitamins. Otherwise, you really want to get your vitamins through the foods that you eat. That you eat. This is how our body is designed. It is designed to get the vitamins from foods. So you want to make sure you're eating foods that have the vitamins that you need. In other words, don't just live off of stuff that is deep fried because they tend to not have all the vitamins that you need. And minerals, as I said before, you're probably familiar with some of these, found naturally in the earth, like iron. And in fact, look at, look at this chart. <clears throat> kind of demonstrating the, the changes in the need of iron over a lifetime. Uh, the blue line represents males, the red line represents females. You can see everybody starts out kind of the same. And then they go into uh, their early teen years. And you see this spike. But then women have this higher continued need for iron. And one of the reasons for that, of course, is because uh, of menstruation. They're going to be losing blood so they're going to be losing red blood cells which means they're going to be losing the iron that's in those red blood cells whereas males can recycle a lot of the iron when red blood cells break apart these are red blood cells that are just lost and then you can see in pregnancy the reason for that is because during pregnancy a woman is going to increase her total blood volume by about 30% or 40 or even up to 50%. And that means a lot more red blood cells, which means a lot more hemoglobin, which means a lot more iron. So they can deliver that oxygen to the uterus. So then that baby can steal it away. And they see the, the drop uh, after menopause. But just a good overview of iron and what um, what can happen if a person takes is no, not if they take in if their body is holding on to too much iron if it's storing too much iron that creates a condition called hemochromatosis and that can actually store it in places like the liver which can be damaging to the liver but there's another one that um, people don't really realize that we have in our bodies people kind of understand that we have iron in our bodies what they don't know is that we have other ones like uh, let me think uh copper back i was showing that electron transport chain in the inner mitochondrial membrane we also have to have copper for us to, to work so yeah we actually have copper in our bodies as well the same thing that pennies are made of but of course a much smaller level However, people can store too much copper as well. It creates a condition called Wilson's disease, which actually has a kind of a unique um, uh, accumulation. You can see it in the iris of the eye, the colored part of their eye. They'll have what we call Kaiser Fleischer rings, and it'll look like sort of a gold halo in their iris. It's kind of actually cool looking. It's not necessarily a good thing, but that is the accumulation of copper. Okay, so if we understand metabolism and what we do in metabolism, we're making things like energy and proteins, or we're utilizing fuels like glucose, oxygen, and water, and we're creating waste products like urea and carbon dioxide. Uh, and we're also creating heat as a byproduct. The metabolic rate, the amount of energy that is uh, created in, in the result of all these biochemical pathways happening. So the, um, the way that most people would understand or, or describe metabolic rate 
is in calories. And this is a term that most people have heard of, calories. However, a calorie is not something you can hold in your hand. A calorie is a unit of measurement. Just like Fahrenheit is a, human, is a unit of measurement, or Celsius is a unit of measurement, or pound, or gram. So a calorie is just a unit of measurement. And technically, the definition of a calorie is the amount of energy that's required to raise the temperature of a one gram of water, one degree Celsius. That's the technical definition of what a calorie is. The amount of energy required to raise one gram of water, one degree Celsius. I should put that on a test. That's a good question. Anyway, when you look on a food label, like if you have a bag of chips and you look on the back of it and it tells you how many calories and how much salt and all those things in it, one thing you'll notice is that the word calorie starts with a capital C. That's what we call a dietary calorie. That's just shorthand writing. So when I say that a calorie, is the amount of energy required to raise one gram of water, one degree Celsius. If we took a thousand calories, then we'd have what we call a kilocalorie. And that is how we measure the uh, calories in food. We measure them in kilocalories. So even though on the back of that label, it doesn't say kilocalories, it just says calories, but it has a capital C that means kilocalories. That's the same thing as a kilocalorie. That's, that's the way that most people would express metabolic rate. A basal metabolic rate describes the energy that's used up just during regular conditions. You're not sleeping, but you're not doing anything active. You're just sort of sitting in a chair. You ate, but it was a while ago. It wasn't 20 minutes ago. It wasn't an hour ago. It was two and a half, three hours ago. And where you're sitting is in a comfortable environment. You're not sitting in one of those cold classrooms in the building where you're shivering where your body's trying to make more energy, trying to make more heat as a byproduct. So those are, this is considered normal conditions. So a person's basal metabolic rate is the amount of energy that's used just in these very simple conditions, normal conditions. Now, of course, people are gonna be different. So there are things that are gonna, uh, determine how much energy they're utilizing. Larger people have larger body surface, so the basal metabolic rate is greater. Uh, one thing that we also include in this is muscle, not just body fat, but body muscle. Because body muscle requires a lot more energy all of the time. So a person who is, let's say, very muscular, they're going to be burning more calories sitting in that normal environment than somebody of similar age, gender, even size, but lacking the muscle. So if you talk to personal trainers, uh, they'll often try to tell you that if you want to burn more calories throughout the day, you want to make sure you have more muscle. 
reps, which means you want to increase your muscle mass, which means you want to include some kind of resistance training in your exercise regime to create extra muscle. And of course, a large muscle that a person has, that most people have, is their gluteus maximus, the big butt muscle. So if you create more of that muscle, you have more muscle mass there, uh, that's going to just burn more calories throughout the day. It's going to increase the uh, basal metabolic rate. Not surprising, things like age are going to change the basal metabolic rate because as we get older, the body's less active, but uh, at the same time, might not have, in their outer years, we might not have as much insulation from the fat. Of course, uh, of course, metabolism is going to be altered by things like medications or drugs. So total metabolic rate is the metabolic rate over a given amount of time. That's just the basic uh, definition of it. Notice this third factor, the thermic effect of foods. How much heat is created as a byproduct? And this pertains to the breakdown of the food stuff. But there is another way that we can describe the thermic effect of the foods, for instance. If you think of the inside of your body, we have a body temperature of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is the normal body temperature where things work uh, most optimally. And we try to regulate so that we maintain that body temperature. But if you ate some ice cream, ice cream is cold. So when that cold ice cream goes into your body, it needs to be warmed up. It needs to be brought up to the temperature. Uh, otherwise, it's going to create cold spots in your body. So there's going to be an increased production of heat just to bring that up to the same temperature. So you could think, well, does that mean I'm burning more calories when I'm eating ice cream? Well, yes. However, ice cream is also made of, you know, fat and sugar. So you're also putting a huge amount of fuel in. But what if you put in something that had no calories, no, no sugar, no fat, like water? but the water was really, really cold. Would you be burning more calories by drinking cold water as compared to warmer water? And the answer is yes, because your body has to bring that cold water up to temperature. So it has to create more heat, which means you have to use more fuel. Now, before you start thinking, well, that's the perfect diet, I'll just start drinking lots and lots of cold water. It's a small amount. It's not a huge amount of uh, extra heat and calories burnt. But it does exist. Also, if you ask a dentist, they will tell you that by drinking cold, cold water, you can actually create micro fractures in your enamel, the enamel of your teeth. So they always recommend drinking cold things through a straw. So it doesn't come in direct contact with the, uh, the enamel on the teeth. But I digress.
So when people ask about things like, well, then how do I lose weight? The answer is really simple, but nobody wants to hear it. Everyone wants to have a, a magical cure. Like, well, all you have to do is eat Snicker bars all day long or Kit Kats or Twix bars and you'll lose weight. That sounds like the perfect diet. Unfortunately, that's not it. Unfortunately, you know what I'm going to say. Eat healthy and exercise. And eat less. Exercise more. I, I, talked about, I think I talked about this a little bit when I talked about the stomach. The stomach has stretch receptors that are one of the things that send signals back to tell you that you're full. Remember, there's, there's hormonal and neural control of uh, stomach and satiety center. So one of the things that these stretch receptors in the stomach say, okay, now you're full. And if you keep eating more and more and more, it causes a reset in those stretch receptors so that now the next time that you eat, you have to eat as much food as you did the last couple of times. Otherwise, your body says, oh, you're not full yet. You're still hungry. So you keep eating. So if you start eating less, over time, it'll reset those stretch receptors back to where uh, it takes less and less food to make you feel full. The problem is that means people have to eat less and feel hungry for a period of time, meaning like about a week of that process of eating less and still feeling hungry and just ignoring it. And that's a difficult thing for people to do. But if you eat less and you exercise more, there is no doubt that you will lose weight. Let me give you um, a quick example here. If Let's say I went to the store and I bought uh, Oreo cookies. And I think everyone's familiar with Oreo cookies. They are delicious. And I bought a big package of the Oreo cookies. And on the package, it read that there are, there's one pound of Oreo cookies inside of that package. If I eat the entire package all at once, how much weight am I going to gain? Well, I'm not going to gain more than one pound worth of weight. In fact, we'll, it'll be less than that, but uh, because there's going to be some stuff that won't be able to break down, won't be able to absorb. So I can't create more weight from that limited amount. Not that I want to gain a pound just from eating cookies, but you won't gain five pounds from eating one pound of cookie. That doesn't, it, physics doesn't work like that. Uh, you'd have to, you'd have to eat five pounds or to eat five pounds to gain five pounds. So if you're eating less, then there's less uh, fuel available. And if you're exercising more, then your body has to tap into other stored energy sources, meaning like fat cells. Now, how long does that take? That's a good question. Typically, when a person is exercising, like they start, they start a jog or a, a brisk walk, typically the first 20 minutes is burning just blood glucose. It hasn't even touched fat reserves yet. Not that that's a bad thing because then the body will have to tap into them to bring the blood sugar back to where it needs to be. But still, if you wanna go beyond that, I always tell people when they're starting an exercise routine of like a brisk walk or a run or something like that, or a bike ride, I always tell them, do a minimum of 22 minutes. 
get past, break that 20 minute mark because then you're going to be tapping into uh, more than just blood sugar. You're going to be tapping into the reserves as well. And that will see the best results. And then over time, uh, in the weeks later, move it to 24 minutes. And then the weeks after that, 26 minutes and so on. But that's, that's it. It's pretty easy. Meaning the, uh, the answer of how to lose weight is pretty simple. Now, please don't, under, please don't misunderstand. I almost said please don't understand. No, please do not misunderstand that it's not just about losing weight. It's not just about how you fit in your clothes or how you fit in a swim costume. It's also about being healthy. So the benefits of that brisk walk are also going to be found in helping to bring you know, keep those cholesterol levels in check by making the good HDLs, the high density lipoproteins, and eating that healthy diet is going to help making sure the person's getting their nutrients that they're supposed to get. And going on that bike ride or that run or that walk uh, mentally helps to kind of clear the mind of it. So there's so many positives to it. It's not just about how you look. Every cell in the body defaults to glucose as its main fuel. That's, that's the preferred and that's the first choice. But if glucose isn't available, then they'll switch to other things. And fats are one of those things. Long-term starvation goes into proteins, but fats are utilized first, which is good and bad. We want to utilize those fats uh, to get the uh, sugars back into the blood if we're in the process of exercising and losing weight and being healthy. But if a person just starts starving themselves, like just not eating, well then there's going to be a sudden shift over to using these fats um, as the preference. And the breakdown of fats can create uh, the, the, the immediate, I should say, breakdown of fats to be utilized can create some byproducts that aren't necessarily good. The gradual breakdown of fats is a good thing. The immediate breakdown of fats because a person is going into a starvation state is a bad thing. We don't want that. Okay, perfect. The hypothalamus, we'll call the hypothalamus is that Part of the diencephalon plays a big role in the endocrine system with those releasing hormones that it creates, as well as things like uh, antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin. Hypothalamus is also a major control center, sets the controls, it sets the, the normal values throughout the body. Remember I said, it's not, the thermostat, it's the guy who sets the thermostat and says, this is normal. Well, we have other areas in the hypothalamus that are dedicated to hunger. The appetite center and the satiety center. Uh, satiated means that you feel full. So you might hear that term from time to time. And there's been a great deal of research and still more to come on both of these because there's a lot of concern about why is it some people seem to just want to eat more and some people just naturally eat less and they always feel they feel full that way.
And I think that's all I want to say about that. I don't want to go into more detail. That's enough. Yeah. All right. So let me get out of here for just a moment. Does anyone have any questions? No. Okay. Well, then I say this is a good time to stop because we're going to get into the urinary system next. So let's take a quick break and I will see you in about two seconds. Okay, we are going to start then in the urinary system. This is a very simply designed system as far as the anatomy goes. The anatomy of the urinary system is elegantly simple. Very, it's just nearly perfect. Um, the physiology gets really complicated. And that's where we are going to sort of just scratch the surface of it. The microanatomy of that stuff is, is a little bit complicated too, as we'll see. But the gross anatomy is easy. Looking at the parts that make up the urinary system, very, very easy. So what does the urinary system do? What are the, what's the responsibility of the kidneys? Well, first of all, major responsibility is to regulate the composition of blood and remove waste products from the body. That's its main job. But it does a lot of other things as well, incredibly important things. So people don't always give kidneys the credit that they're due, which is why when I uh, describe the uh, three most important organs of the body, first most important is the brain, Everyone kind of gets that. The second most important is the heart. And that kind of makes sense for pumping the blood around. The main pump moves those nutrients around. But the third most important are the kidneys. And a lot of people don't really understand that because they don't understand all the things that the kidneys can do, all the things they're responsible for doing. So uh, we will see some of these things coming up here in a minute. But what that means is if a patient has a disease, the first thing we want to know is how's that disease going to affect the brain, followed by how's that disease going to affect the heart, followed by how's that disease going to affect the kidneys. So when we treat the patient, every treatment that we give, the first thing we want to think of is how's that treatment going to affect the brain, followed by how's it going to affect the heart, followed by how's it going to affect the kidneys. And I know that uh, the first instinct is to think, well, aren't there medications that specifically are harmful to the liver, for instance, or to bone or bone marrow? Absolutely. But we still always think in that order, of first, second, and third, uh, because those are the most important organs. So we'll see some of these things that make kidneys so important here in just a moment. All right, so we're going to move on to was that chapter 23, I believe? The urinary system. So again, you should see my screen right about now, chapter 23. Urinary system doesn't just produce urine. In fact, the production of urine is the result of regulating the composition of blood and removing waste products from the body. So as it does the most important thing, it creates urine. And we'll see some of those other things that it does here in a moment. So let's first actually go to just the gross anatomy. Looking at the gross anatomy of the urinary system, we see that there are two kidneys. They are about four inches in length, 
weigh about half a pound, brownish in color, and they are shaped, not surprisingly, like a kidney bean. Located in the retroperitoneal space, this is in the flank of the back, so they're more towards the back of the body. They have a hilum, an indented area where everything either comes in or goes out of them. So if I zoom in a little bit here, if you look at the renal artery going into the kidney and the renal vein coming out, and you can see it on the right kidney here. And then there is this long tube called a ureter, which moves urine from the kidneys down to the urinary bladder. The urinary bladder is a storage site for collecting and storing the urine. And then of course it is going to release it when it's full through this tube called the urethra. That is going to take the urine from the bladder to the outside world. So the design is really simple. These two kidneys that are gonna be filtering blood, getting rid of those waste products and collecting those waste products, I should say first, and then moving those waste products down those tubes, those ureters, and then storing that in the bladder and then getting rid of it to the outside world. So blood is constantly moving through the kidneys. So blood is constantly being filtered, which means urine is constantly being produced, moved down these ureters and going into the urinary bladder. So the urinary bladder is really there for convenience because otherwise we would just be walking around constantly dripping urine as we walked around. So it makes it convenient to store it for a while until we can get rid of it all at once. And of course, that would happen through the urethra. Uh, now, even though the kidneys are higher up in the body and the bladder is lower in the body and these tubes, the ureters, connect the kidneys to the bladder, you'd think that urine just drains right down into the bladder, kind of like water running down a gutter in the house. But this is not a gravity fed system. Urine is actually propelled down the ureters into the urinary bladder. There is a muscle in the walls of those ureters that are going to create that peristalsis that we talked about before, that wave like motion that is going to propel the urine down to the bladder. And of course, that's smooth muscle because you can't control it, it's involuntary. That's why you can be lying down and still have urine flowing from the kidneys down to the bladder. It is not just, it's not a gravity fed system. Urine is propelled that way. It kind of makes sense. Notice on each of the two kidneys, there is uh, the adrenal glands. So just sitting on top like a cap. Something else you might notice is that the right kidney, and again, we're always talking about the patient's right or left side. The right kidney kind of looks like it's a little bit lower than the left kidney. And it actually is. If you look at where you find the, the left kidney is at about the level of L1 approximately. Uh, the right kidney is about approximate level of L2. And the reason for that is because of the liver. The liver takes up a lot of space on the right side. And as we are growing in the uterus from very, very small creatures to larger creatures, uh, we are growing longer and the kidneys are gonna start out lower. And as we grow longer, they are going to ascend but the right kidney cannot ascend as high because the liver takes up some space there. If we look at this section of it, oops, there we go. Try to keep the, the 
the directional compass in the picture. This is a cut section that we would see on like a CAT scan, a CT scan. So anytime you see a CT type scan, a CT type picture, you have to imagine the patient is lying on their back and you are looking, you're standing at the patient's feet, looking up towards their head. So we're seeing like the lower aspects of some of these things. One thing that gives it away that the patient's on their back is that vertebra. You can see the spinous process, uh, obviously. The, the part that sticks out the back, you know, more towards the surface there. And you can see the peritoneal cavity that is within that, the lining of the peritoneum. Remember that double layer membrane that is in the abdominal pelvic cavity. And you see the kidneys sit quite a bit towards the back. You can also see the aorta as well as the inferior vena cava. So if nothing else, you can get the idea that when you're looking at a CT scan like this, unless otherwise told, unless it's designated somewhere, you have to think of the patient being on their back and you're standing at their feet, looking up towards their head and somebody just took a big blade and sliced them. And that's what you're seeing there, that slice. Another nice view of the proximal location of the kidneys and the ureters. You'll notice there are bends in the ureters. This significance of not noticing the bends is in the event that there is some sort of blockage, like a kidney stone. If it is coming down the ureter, uh, the places that it's most likely to get stuck is either right at the beginning, like in the kidney, or at one of these bends that you can see here. So that's, that's the only significance of me telling you that. Uh, starting with the male, you see the ureter coming down to the urinary bladder. And then underneath the urinary bladder in the male, there is the prostate gland and the urethra runs through the prostate, through the middle of the prostate, so it's completely surrounded. Uh, the, the urethra is completely surrounded by the prostate. And then it runs the length of the penis to the very opening called the urinary meatus, or you'll hear me call it the urethral meatus. Meatus, it's spelled M-E-A-T-U-S, so you wanna say meatus, but it is pronounced meatus. This is an opening. I think we saw this before as well. But uh, in the male, the urethra is seven to eight inches long. And it has a dual purpose. Not only is it going to be the way that urine leaves the bladder to the outside world, but it is also going to carry that fluid which transports sperm. We'll talk about that next week in the urinary, in the, sorry, in the male and female reproductive systems. Well, looking at the female, again, we see the kidney with the ureter coming down. But if you look at the urinary bladder, the uterus, which is right here, is sitting right on top, in a normal position of the uterus, at least, is what's called antiflexion, where it's sitting on top of the urinary bladder, sort of tilted towards the front. And remember that uterus, that's right here, that uterus in a nolligravida female, a woman who's never ever been pregnant, is about three inches in length, which is not very big. Um, but you can also imagine how it can stretch and hold a baby. And if it's in this antiflex position, and there's a baby in there that's going to start pressing down on the urinary bladder, which is why she's going to be more frequently making trips to the restroom. 
Uh, you can also see the short urethra in females. The urethra is about one to two inches long uh, to the urethral meatus, to the outside lobe. Just anterior to the opening of the vagina, the vaginal introitus. But this is why women get urinary tract infections so much more commonly than men do because of that short urethra. Once bacteria get into the bladder, well, now they have a place where they can sort of hide and grow. There are lots of folds, as we'll see, where they can sort of hide and grow and grow and grow. How do bacteria get into the bladder? Well, all they have to do is ascend the urethra. And they have to do that before a stream of urine comes and pushes them out of the way. Well, in the female, that urethra is very short, one to two inches long. In the male, it's a seven to eight inch long urethra. So it's much less likely for a, in the male for the bacteria to make their way all the way up the urethra before a stream of urine comes and flushes them out. It's gonna take them obviously much longer to make that journey. This is also why we tell women to make sure that they empty their bladder post coitus because the process of engaging in that type of activity, it increases the likelihood of any bacteria that's around the meatus, around the opening, to get pushed up inside, start their journey up the urethra. So we suggest making sure that you empty your bladder afterwards. You may have also heard of cranberry juice uh, helping to get rid of urinary tract infections. Uh, there's some evidence to support this. And the reality is it changes the pH of the urine, makes the environment less hospitable for the bacteria. So the best thing she should be doing is drinking a small glass of cranberry juice every day. That is going to help probably more as preventive uh, to, to decrease the likelihood of that happening to begin with. Once it's there, it's going to help a little bit, but uh, it's not going to be the only thing to make it go away typically. So it's a much better preventive method so we always suggest that women drink a small glass of cranberry juice every day. And that has to be the straight cranberry juice, not like the cran apple or cran grape or something like that. Just regular straight cranberry juice. No, not cranberry and vodka, that doesn't count. Just regular straight cranberry juice. It certainly won't hurt. So even though there's there's a little bit of disagreement on how effective it is. Uh, it certainly is not gonna be a bad thing. Now, when can we see the male getting urinary tract infections? Well, if that prostate enlarges and squeezes around the urethra, that decreases the force at which urine comes flowing out of the bladder. And that decreased force can actually allow bacteria uh, to make it through and help their chances of making its way all the way up into the prostate and into the bladder. Also, when uh, we're using a Sorry. Also, when we're using a catheter, 
we want to use a sterile technique because that catheter will do two things. It'll first push a bacteria right up into the urinary bladder, but it'll also act as a conduit. It'll act like a, a ladder almost for bacteria to climb all the way up into the bladder. So we can see that happening as uh, a cause for men to get urinary tract infections. As well as any scar tissue that can be found in the urethra. As a result of things like a gonorrhea infection or previous gonorrhea infection, I should say, that could create scar tissue in the urethra. That scar tissue is an area where bacteria can sort of hide and rest until they continue making their journey up. So do men get urinary tract infections? Yes, but not nearly as often as women do. And when they do get urinary tract infections, it's usually because of one of those reasons. Either enlarged prostate for whatever reason, or uh, use of a catheter or scar tissue. Okay, let's see. Did I cover all this pretty much? Didn't talk about the renal fat pad, but that's okay right now. Talk about the high level. Okay, good. So what's a kidney look like? Let's take a closer look at the organ itself. I'm going to go straight to this slide. So there's a nice cut section of the kidney. We start out, I'll start out with this one here just for a moment. Because here you can see the renal artery coming in. You can see the renal vein leaving. And you can also see the ureter leaving. Notice how everything is entering or leaving this kidney in this one indented area. That indented area is what we call the hilum. You can see as the renal artery comes in, it branches off into smaller arteries, these lobar arteries, which then branch off into arcuate arteries, which then branch off into interlobular lob, arteries. Uh, but I'm not going to make you responsible for knowing uh, these small little vessels or what order they come in. I just want you to see how the artery comes in and branches off and branches off and branches off. Or as, of course, in the vein, they're coming together, coming together, coming together. But let's zip back over to this picture for a moment. And you'll notice, where is the renal? What do, well, here it is, okay. There's an inner part called the renal medulla. There's an outer part called a cortex or renal cortex. There it is. And then there's a capsule that is giving strength, maintaining the integrity of the organ. So there's an inner part. And again, this is basic terminology from way back, uh, the medulla. There's an outer part, the cortex. And I think we actually saw this in the um, adrenal glands as well. We talked about it. Then I want you to notice that there are these triangular shaped areas called renal pyramids, or they call them here, the medullary pyramids. Uh, these are triangular shaped if you're looking at them in two dimension like you are here. In three dimension, they're actually shaped more like a pyramid, meaning the base of them is wider and the tip of them is more narrow, but they have more of a pyramid shape to them. And it is, in these where we're going to find collecting ducts that have collected the filtrate, but is now going to be called urine. And it's going to drain towards the tip of these pyramids into these small collecting tubes called a calyx. And these are small calyces 
we call those minor calyces or a minor calyx. And a couple of the minor calyces will drain into a larger area called a major calyx, which will then drain into the renal pelvis. Renal pelvis, that's the funnel-shaped area, which then is going to become part of the ureter. So you can kind of imagine the urine draining from these pyramids towards the tip of the pyramid into this little tube and a bunch of little tubes collect into this area, which then collects into this funnel shaped area, which then becomes the tube, the ureter that's going to deliver it to the urinary bladder. See, I think I've covered everything. Yes. Notice calyx, C A L Y X. Um, it can also be a singular. Calyces is plural, calyx is singular. You may also see it spelled with an I, C A L I X. So it has two different spellings there. We will talk about the afferent arterioles shortly. That is the gross structure of the kidney. So the ureters, again, the tubes that are running down from the kidney to the urinary bladder, composed of muscle in their walls, and not surprisingly, there's a lining of mucus. Because remember, we want to trap things if we can. But don't forget the muscular part, that is smooth muscle. Here is a microscopic view, cut section of a ureter. So when you think of that tube that runs from the kidney down to the urinary bladder, you might think of it as being like a hose where the center of it is round. But actually, you can see here, the lumen of it kind of is an irregular sort of shape to it, almost like a star in a sense. That whole white area in the center, that's the lumen, and that's the opening. And then there is muscle, smooth muscle. Remember, smooth muscle is involuntary. So that is going to help propel the urine down to the urinary bladder. It's a nice uh, microscopic view of it there. The urinary bladder and this one is a male urinary bladder has the two ureters entering, as you can see here, we have a right ureter and a left ureter. And you can see where they're entering, the openings of the ureters here and here. And then there is one opening where the uh, bladder neck is, where the urethra is going to start, that's where the urine leaves. So if you sort of drew a line between these two openings of the ureters and down uh, to the urethra, it sort of creates this triangular area called the trigon, which is a little different. Uh, the tissue structure is just a little different. It doesn't have the same groups of rugae, which are these folds, just like we saw in the stomach, actually, that allows for expansion, like an accordion. So in other words, this can stretch and hold more. The rounded dome-shaped part of the bladder, it's not listed here, but that is called the fundus, just like we saw with the stomach, the rounded dome-shaped part of the stomach called the fundus.
the detrusor muscle is the main muscle of the bladder because the bladder does squeeze to push that urine out. There is, however, a doorway here, a muscular doorway, and then there's another one here called the urethral sphincters. There is one that is internal, one that is external. So there's two doorways that stop urine from leaving the bladder and going to the outside world. However, only one of these muscular doorways is under voluntary control. That is the external urethral sphincter. The internal urethral sphincter is in is under involuntary control. And of course, involuntary control means that you can control it. When the bladder decides it's time to empty, when it gets the message for that detrusor muscle to squeeze the urine out, that internal urethral sphincter is going to relax. You cannot control that. However, thankfully, we do have control at the external urethral sphincter. So when you got to go and you're holding it, well, that's why. That's the, that's the area that's holding it. You'll also notice, because this is the male bladder, there is the prostate gland, which is a walnut-sized and kind of walnut-shaped gland right at the base of the urinary bladder. The, the urethra goes through it, so the prostate completely surrounds it all the way around, which we'll talk about a little bit next week, why, why that is a good thing to understand. It's also where the ejaculatory duct comes in and meets the urethra, because again, the male urethra has two purposes. And then there are the bulbo-urethral glands, these little pea-sized glands on either side, sometimes called the Cowper's glands. So you might see it as that too, Cowper's, but the bulbo-urethral glands. I'll tell you what these do. Because remember, the male urethra has dual purpose. And urine is very acidic, has a low pH. Because of that, sperm cells, the spermatozoa, as they come through in the fluid, can be damaged if there are any tiny droplets of urine still within the urethra. So what the body wants to do is to neutralize the lining of the urethra before that fluid, the ejaculate comes out with those sperm cell. They don't want the spermatozoa, the sperm cells to be damaged by any acidity. So a little bit of fluid is going to be released beforehand to neutralize the urethra This fluid can be referred to as the pre-ejaculate, although I'm sure that you have other terms that you've heard for this, uh, but that is its purpose. And we'll talk about that a little bit more next week. So that is the basis, basis of the urinary bladder. It's pretty simple. Again, it has those stretch receptors that are gonna say, okay, we've stretched far enough. Now it's time for that muscle to contract and push the urine out. By the way, the number one cause of bladder cancer in the United States is cigarette smoking.
And that's one of those things that people don't necessarily realize because when people think about cigarette smoking, they think, okay, lung cancer, because of course, smoke's going in the lungs. So maybe also it could damage the trachea, the larynx, there could be cancer in those areas, maybe even the esophagus, maybe even the pharynx, the throat, maybe even the mouth. But how does it end up in the bladder? Well, remember when people smoke cigarettes, there's a lot of carcinogenic substances that do end up going into the blood. And the kidneys filter those carcinogenic substances out of the blood and they end up collecting and sitting in areas in the bladder. And over time, those carcinogenic substances irritating the cells cause the cells to change. And when cells change, we call, we call that cancer. So in the United States, most people who have bladder cancer have bladder cancer from smoking cigarettes. I say in the United States because there's other things that can cause bladder cancer, like naphthalene dyes. Those are kind of regulated a little bit more here. And schistosoma infection, type of parasite infection. But we don't see that as much in the US. So FYI, another reason not to smoke cigarettes, bladder cancer. That'd probably be a good test question too. Well, I've already made up the final exam, so if it's not on there already, be too late to put it on because I already have the review for that. That wouldn't be fair. All right, maybe the next time. Did I put it on? Yeah, I'm doing the final. All right, I think that's it. I think that's covered everything on the. Um, yeah, I think I covered everything on the bladder. The urethra now it'll be no surprise whatsoever to find out that the urethra is lined with a mucous membrane, creates mucus. Because remember, the skin is our primary immune barrier, but everywhere we have an opening, we're gonna create mucus. And of course, we have the uh, urethral meatus, the opening to the outside world. And that is one more entrance way for things to get in. So anywhere we have an opening, we create mucus because mucus is sticky and that traps things. So sir. Yes. Uh, do the mucus um, collect some of the carcinogenic? When you're smoking inside the urethra? It's no more inside the bladder. Because remember, as things are passing through the urethra, they're passing with some force. In other words, when you're peeing, stuff's getting pushed out with some force. So it's not necessarily just sitting there. So it's much, much, much less likely. Okay. Yeah. Although they're there can be times where there's inflammation of the urethra. Not surprisingly, that's called urethritis. Inflammation of the urethra, urethritis. And we actually classify urethritis as two, well, two classifications. Either gonococcal urethritis, meaning urethritis caused by gonorrhea, or non-gonococcal urethritis, meaning urethritis caused by everything other than gonorrhea, which means there must be a lot of gonorrhea, and there is. But 
that's about the majority of the problems that can occur um, other than congenital conditions. There is a condition called hypospadias. Well, there's epispadias as well, but hypospadias is much more common. This is where the opening of the urethra, the urethral meatus, occurs in an area um, other than at the tip, at the tip of the glans penis. So it occurs on the underside of the penis. There's an opening of the urethra. And it's actually the most common congenital genitourinary abnormality. What that means is you're probably going to know somebody at some point who has a boy who was born with this. Now, the good news is it's usually an easy surgical fix. As long as the urethral meata still extends or the urethra still extends to the tip of the glands penis, um, all they have to do is sort of put a catheter in for a little bit and close up the other opening that might be there. But otherwise, it's, uh, it's a pretty easy surgical fix. Micturition, also known as urination, also known as voiding. So you'll hear these ter this terminology used interchangeably. Peeing, all the same thing. But the, the medical terms that you'll hear is micturition, urination, or voiding. Sometimes you'll hear passing water as sort of an older not so medical term, but or an older term for it. I think I already talked about those things. That word there sounds like um, the word that you, the medical word you use for chewing. Mastication. Yeah, those two sound pretty similar. Yes, don't mix them up. Yeah, don't mix them up. Mastication is chewing, micturition is being. Okay. So the gross anatomy of the urinary system, elegant and simple, very nice. The microscopic anatomy, this is where it gets a little more complicated, but this is also where the filtration stuff takes place. And the filtration unit is called the nephron. This is the functional unit of the kidney, or you'll hear me use the term parenchyma. Parenchyma simply means functional unit. This is the place where filtration occurs. Actually, more than just filtration, filtration and reabsorption. So let's see what this looks like for just a moment. This is what a nephron will look like. Let me enlarge it so you can just see the nephron without the collecting duct. This part here is what the nephron looks like. It starts out with this big round area, big round hollow area, like a sphere all hollow before we put anything in it. And then it has this tubing that goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. That connects to a long tube that dips down, does a U-turn and then comes back up again to another little tube that goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, which eventually connects to this part called a collecting duct. And that's what all these little short branches represent. These are other nephrons connecting to that collecting duct. Other nephrons connecting to that collecting duct. Yeah, I said that right. 
So this is where filtration of the blood actually occurs. So how does that happen? Well, as we saw earlier, we have the renal artery that comes in and branches off into smaller arteries and then smaller arteries and smaller arteries, eventually branching off to, we're gonna call it this artery here, called the afferent arteriole. So it is coming into this first part of the nephron, that rounded sphere part called the Bowman's capsule. As the afferent arteriole goes into the Bowman's capsule, it branches off into this network of tiny capillaries called the glomerulus. And these tiny capillaries have small, small openings or pores. You'll hear me use the term fenestration, but they're just small little openings. And it is in those small little openings that stuff will pass from the blood and collect inside of the Bowman's capsule. So the filtration is occurring at the level of the glomerulus and the filtrate, the stuff that we filter out is first collected in the Bowman's capsule. Then you'll notice that those little capillaries come back together and create a small artery that is leaving. That is an efferent arterial, the Bowman's capsule. And we'll talk about why that is in just a few minutes. But you can see that blood goes through these little, cap these little capillaries called the glomerulus small little particles that can fit through these little openings get forced out as a result of blood pressure. Anything that's big or too large to get forced out just remains in the blood, things like red blood cells. And then that blood ends up leaving again out of the Bowman's capsule. So all of the stuff that is collected is what we call filtrate. We don't call it urine yet. We just call it filtrate. And that filtrate moves out of the Bowman's capsule into this first part called the proximal convoluted tubule. Now, don't get uh, intimidated by this terminology. A tubule is just a fancy word for saying small tube. Kind of like organelle inside of cells is just a fancy way of saying small organ or little organ. So a tubule is just a small tube. Convoluted means it goes back and forth. It has a lot of twists and turns in it. So the term convoluted just means a bunch of twists and turns. And of course, proximal means it's towards the beginning, right? It's towards the starting point. So the filtrate that has been pushed out of the glomerulus, out of those capillaries, is collected in the Bowman's capsule first, and then moves into the proximal convoluted tubule. Then that filtrate moves down into this long loop of Henle. And you'll notice it's designated descending loop, uh, ascending loop, thick loop, thin loop. But for right now, it goes down into this long loop and then comes back up again. That takes us to the distal convoluted tubule. So another little tubule that goes back and forth, has a lot of twists and turns, but it's at the distal end. It's at the further end of the nephron. Then that filtrate moves into the collecting duct. Once it moves into the collecting duct, now we call it urine. And then that's gonna take it down and down to the tip of that renal pyramid that we saw before, into those minor calluses, then to the major calluses, then to the renal uh, pelvis, then to the ureter, then to the bladder, then to the urethra, then to the outside world. So that nephron starts with the Bowman's capsule and completes with that distal convoluted tubule connecting to the collecting duct. And each kidney has about a million of these little functional units, these little nephrons 
that are going to do the filtration part. Okay, so going back, I said that that small little artery, that afferent arteriole, enters the Bowman's capsule, and that's actually C here. You can see it at this point. It enters the Bowman's capsule, that afferent arteriole. In this case, it is showing it here. And then it branches off into these bunch of little capillaries, which you can kind of see a little bit better here, called the glomerulus. And then it reforms again into this efferent arteriole. So things that did not get filtered out are going to remain in the blood and leave that Bowman's capsule. However, that efferent arteriole, you can see here, as it's leaving, this is the one on top, is the efferent arteriole, as it leaves the Bowman's capsule, Notice how it wraps around the different parts and the different areas of the nephron and comes in contact with it. So you can see it again here as well. The efferent arterial is wrapping around these different parts of the nephron. So why is it doing this? Good question and an important question. When we filter stuff out of our blood, we filter out the waste products, that stuff we wanna get rid of. However, we also filter out a lot of stuff that we want to keep. So think about a person who has a swimming pool in their backyard. They wanna keep their swimming pool clean. So the water gets pumped through a small pipe out of the swimming pool, goes into a filter. The filter catches leaves and twigs and dirt and stuff. And then the water goes back into a pipe and then back into the swimming pool again. So the water leaves the pool, goes through the filter, the filter catches debris, and then the water goes back into the swimming pool again. Cleaner, of course. However, what would happen if the water didn't come back? into the swimming pool. Well, then the swimming pool would just keep getting empty and empty and empty. We'd have to just keep filling it up, filling it up, filling it up, filling it up, filling it up. When we filter our blood, we filter out a huge amount of water. A lot of water gets lost in that Bowman's capsule when the filtration takes place. And we don't want to lose a lot of water. We don't want to be dehydrated constantly. We want to bring most of that water back in. That's why this efferent arterial wraps around different parts of the nephron, comes in contact with it. Because we want to reabsorb things that we've lost that we didn't want to lose. And about 95% of the water that we initially filter out, we actually reabsorb back in. So that's kind of important. This is where the antidiuretic hormone comes in. Remember the antidiuretic hormone stops a patient from peeing out too much water? This is why, this is, and this is where it happens. We want to be able to 
we absorb that water that we lost and we do we absorb most of it like i said about 95 percent of that water gets reabsorbed plus other things can be reabsorbed as well like salt or other maybe even small particles maybe even nutrients protons but we can still even filter some things in other words, if there's still some things that we want to move out, they too can cross over and go from that efferent arterial into that proximal convoluted tubule, for instance. So there's still the possibility, even after stuff leaves uh, the, the Bowman's capsule here, we still have the ability to reabsorb a lot and even filter a little bit at the same time. That's why, as I said earlier, we still call that material that is in those tubules, we still call that filtrate. We don't call it urine until it dumps into the collecting duct. Because now once it's in the collecting duct, we pretty much have lost that ability to reabsorb things. So that is why it's really important for that efferent arterial to come around and wrap around. That's why this nephron has all of these different loops and twists and turns to it. It has all those loops and twists and turns because we want to have the ability for the blood to come in contact, for the arterial to come in contact and say, okay, let's reabsorb some stuff back in. It's kind of very, very, very useful. important thing to realize. Okay, so we saw, yeah, saw some of this. Good, okay. Looking at the Bowman's capsule here with the afferent arterial coming in, the efferent arterial leaving the glomerulus in the center. There's also something here called the juxtaglomerular apparatus. This is an important little area because it is gonna have the ability to sense things, sense things like blood pressure, for instance. So if it senses that blood pressure is low, it can send out a message that'll help increase blood pressure that we'll talk about in just a little bit. When we talk about the other things that the kidneys can do. So it's an important thing to sort of notice right there the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Okay, I think I talked about that. Uh, we pretend we talked about that, just a convoluted tubule. Talked about that, juxtaglomerular apparatus. Talked about the collecting ducts. And again, I'm just gonna say this again here. Notice with the blood supply of the nephron, afferent arterial enters the Bowman's capsule and branches off into that glomerulus. The efferent arterial uh, leaves the glomerulus, circles back around. I bring that up because I talked about these, this terminology at some point in the past. I don't remember exactly when, but I talked about uh, knowing afferent and efferent. Oh, with the nervous system, that's right. We're talking about the spinal nerves. And I said, remember the afferent nerves are um, accepting incoming messages and the efferent nerves, those nerves are exiting. They're going away from the spinal cord. And I said, it's just good to know the terminology afferent and efferent because afferent means uh, coming in, efferent means going away. And I said, we'd see that again. Well. Here we are seeing it again. Okay, so I think that was it. I want to talk about that.
Yeah, that was in, um, I think it was in a nervous system. Yes. Absolutely was. I think um, the cell sending a message out and sending a message from or something. Right. The efferent are the nerves that send the messages away from the spinal cord. They're exiting the spinal cord, those messages. The afferent messages are coming into the spinal cord. So they're arriving at the spinal cord. They're coming in. I think that was what I used, arriving. Yeah, arriving messages are afferent. Uh, exiting messages are efferent. So. As I've mentioned before, a lot of what we're learning in this course is just basic terminology. And basic terminology really just means memorization. There's no shortcut to it. There's also no understanding. You don't actually have to understand why it means something. It's more about just memorizing. And that this is why I stressed way back in week number one how important medical terminology is uh, because it makes learning everything so much easier if you can have the basic terminology down, then a lot of things just kind of make sense. But I think, where are we on here? Okay, we're good. I think I wanna pause for a moment. Are there any other questions right now? No. No. Okay. So um, we'll come back. I'm going to pause here. We'll come back uh, in just about one second. Why can't I get that to pause? Oops. Why can't I get this to pause? Okay. So we'll come back in one second. Coming back. And we are going to discuss, I'm going to discuss here to two the parts of the urinary system that is an interesting part because again remember that the the main job of the urinary system the job of the kidneys is to regulate the composition of blood and remove waste products from the body but the kidney does other things as well and i'm going to put some of those things uh in writing here in just a moment because i do want you to realize them before we actually get back into the slides and uh, i'm going to go into a bit of detail a little bit later on with one of these other things so let's just jump right in here so you should be able to see my screen oh right about now i would say there we go so what do the kid kidneys do other than regulate the composition of blood and remove, remove waste products from the body? So we'll put this as other functions of the kidneys. First other function of the kidney. Regulate blood pressure. That's an important function. Remember, we have to maintain a certain blood pressure to make sure the blood gets pumped throughout the body. We want it to go everywhere it needs to go, which is going to require a certain pressure gradient. And we are gonna do this with the help of the kidneys because the kidneys are going to help reabsorb water back into the system with the help of things like the antidiuretic hormone ADH. If we bring water back into the system, we increase blood volume. If we increase blood volume, we increase blood pressure. And that occurs at the in the nephron, in those tubule parts, where water channels will allow for the, for the reabsorption of all that water that we lost. Also, what will be affected in those tubules is the reabsorption of salt, sodium. And this happens because of 
the hormone aldosterone, which helps to reabsorb salt back into the blood. And remember, water follows salt. So if we bring salt back into the blood, then we are going to bring water back into the blood, which is gonna increase blood volume, which is gonna increase blood pressure. And then also something I talked about a little bit ago, sub, uh, the juxtaglomerular apparatus, which we saw there uh, at the beginning of the Bowman's capsule. The juxtaglomerular apparatus can sense changes in blood pressure. And if it senses that there has been a decrease in blood pressure, it will release a substance called renin. Renin will then go on to activate angiotensinogen. Angiotensinogen will then be converted to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 will go to the lungs where it is converted to angiotensin 2 using the angiotensin converting enzyme. Angiotensin 2 will then go out and increase peripheral resistance. In other words, constriction of those vessels, which will increase blood pressure. And it'll also secondarily cause the release of aldosterone, which will cause sodium to be reabsorbed, <coughs> excuse me, to cause water to be reabsorbed which will increase blood volume, which will increase blood pressure. That is called the renin angiotensin system. Uh, although I think now they call it the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, I think, uh, but we'll see that in a little bit. So I'll, I'll put that up with the details in it. And there's a reason I'll put the details in it because I want you to recognize uh, the function of the angiotensin converting enzyme that leads to this increase in blood pressure. But other functions of the kidneys, number one, regulate blood pressure. Number two, uh, regulate, get that spelling correctly, regulate blood pH. And it does this through the synthesis or the creation of bicarbonate, HCO3 minus, minus sign there. Bicarbonate is the most powerful buffer that we have in our blood. So if the blood pH begins to get a little bit low, Normally it's right around 7.4, but if it starts to become too acidic, the number starts to go a little low, the kidneys can create more bicarbonate to help raise the pH back to where it should be. And it does this through a process we call de novo synthesis, which is a really fancy term to mean it does it by scratch. It makes this from scratch. So that is a pretty important thing that we maintain that nice 7.4 pH of our blood. So to have the ability to buffer it when needed uh, is, is pretty important. I'll have to create a little more room here. The third, other function of the kidney. Regulate red blood cell production. Now I know you're thinking, but I thought red blood cells, like all blood cells were created in the bone marrow. Uh, and you're right, red blood cells and all blood cells are created in the bone marrow. Oh, sorry. However, the kidneys can produce something called, make sure I get the spelling of this correct, 
erythro, P-O-I-E-T-I-N, erythropoietin. Let's see if that's correct. E -R -E -R -E yes. Erythropoietin will go from the kidneys to the bone marrow, especially like that red bone marrow. And it will tell the bone marrow to make more red blood cells and take the ones that you've already started to make and mature them faster. Because you'll remember <clears throat> all these blood cells start off as that hematopoietic pluripotential stem cell in the bone marrow. But then it has to go through that process of becoming uh, an immature cell, whatever the lineage is gonna become. And then it continues to move on eventually until it becomes mature. It has to go down that pathway that we saw before. So this hormone, which is what it is, erythropoietin, is released from the kidneys when it senses that there is a major uh, decrease in blood pressure, for instance. So let's say that a person was in a severe accident and was losing a lot of blood and their blood pressure dropped. Their kidneys would sense this and say, well, if your blood pressure dropped that much that fast, you must be losing a lot of blood, which means you must have lost a lot of red blood cells, which means we better make more red blood cells as quickly as possible. And that's what this does. So uh, what are some of the things that the kidneys do other than regulate the composition of blood and remove waste products from the kidney? Well, first of all, they help to regulate blood pressure and that's kind of a big deal. Then they also regulate blood pH through the de novo synthesis, synthesis of bicarbonate. That's kind of a big deal. And then they help to regulate the production of red blood cells uh, through the release of erythropoietin, which again is kind of a big deal. And that's, oh, uh oh. Where'd you go? And that's not all they do. They do more on top of that. I hope I didn't lose you. Are you still there? Oh, good. Thank you. Okay. I was concerned maybe my internet just went out. All right. Yeah. So, so let's talk about that renin thing for just a moment because this is kind of a big deal. When those JG, the juxtaglomerular cells, identify that drop in blood pressure or a lower blood pressure, they release renin. Renin activates angiotensinogen. I am. Can you see it? No. Okay. Maybe I did lose something there. Let's see. I don't know why that happened. Okay, can you see it now? Yes. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for letting me know because this is going to get complicated in just a moment. So when the kidneys sense the blood pressure is low, those juxtaglomerular cells are going to release a substance called renin. Renin then activates angiotensinogen. Angiotensinogen is converted to angiotensin 1. which then goes 
to the lungs. One, it's an unusual looking lung, but a lung nonetheless. nonetheless. It goes to the lungs and is converted to angiotensin II. And, wait, I'm missing an N. Angiotensin II. And angiotensin II then does two things. First, it is going to increase peripheral resistance. That's peripheral. And then second, it's going to cause release of aldosterone which as I said, aldosterone is going to cause sodium reabsorption, cause water to come in, increases uh, the blood volume. So both of these two things, and I'll put it in purple for no particular reason, both of these two things are increasing blood pressure. A step here is the angiotensin converting enzyme. C enzyme. Spell today. Enzyme. There we are. So in the lungs, we have the angiotensin converting enzyme that converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 goes out and increases peripheral resistance, which is going to raise, raise blood pressure. And then secondarily, causes the release of aldosterone, which causes sodium reabsorption, which causes water to be reabsorbed, which causes an increase in blood pressure. So both of these things cause an increase in blood pressure. Okay, so why am I telling you all this? Why do you care about all this biochemistry that's happening here? The reason is because if a patient has high blood pressure, what we can do is we can give them a medication that will block that conversion from happening. We call that an ACE. Inhibitor. Inhibitor. That's where the ACE comes from. Angiotensin converting enzyme. If we block that from doing its job, then angiotensin one will not become angiotensin two, which means there won't be an increase in blood pressure, which means it'll cause the person's blood pressure to be lower. This is a very popular blood pressure medication that is used. Uh, we will put these in the category called the prills. Like lisinopril or captopril. These blood pressure medications are going to stop that enzyme from doing its job. So it will inhibit that enzyme, the angiotensin converting enzyme, which means the blood pressure will not be raised through this process. And that'll help keep the person's blood pressure lower. Very common, commonly used um, the blood pressure regulation medication, regulating medication, blood pressure regulating medication probably only second to um, hydrochlorothiazide, HCTZ, the water pill. That's usually, that's a little more benign. That's usually used sort of as a first medication when people are first diagnosed with high blood pressure, if it's kind of mild. 
they usually start out with something like um, the water pill, HCTZ. But uh, then when we, we have to step it up, this is one of the ones that a lot of, a lot of doctors will then go to. It's beta blockers as well. Beta blockers are going to decrease contractility of the heart, and that's going to decrease the uh, cardiac output, which is going to decrease blood pressure as well. It's also beta blockers are also going to have the secondary effect of decreasing heart rate, which is kind of nice also. But you'll hear about these a lot. You'll hear about ACE inhibitors a lot because they're used a lot to help keep blood pressure lower. And this is how they work. And this all starts way back with renin from the kidneys. So kidneys do a lot. Oops. So I know it's, I know it's a lot to kind of take in. Um, don't think that I'm ever going to say, okay, write out the, the renin angiotensin system and how it works. Because I wouldn't do that to you. I don't think you need to know all these uh, steps here in between. But you should be aware of what ACE inhibitors do and where they work and how they work. Because, and let me actually use a different color here. Let's use uh, orange or brownish orange. Because if this person's body is still releasing renin and renin still activates angiotensinogen and angiotensinogen is still converted to angiotensin one, but it's blocked in the lungs from converting. That means there's gonna be a buildup of angiotensin one in the lungs. Because remember, everything you put in your body is gonna have a side effect, doesn't matter what it is. So oftentimes, if there's a buildup of this angiotensin one, it'll cause an irritation in the lungs, which means the patient is going to <clears throat> always sound like they're <clears throat> trying to <clears throat> clear their throat because <clears throat> they're always gonna have this little bit of a <clears throat> irritation if they get a, a lot of that angiotensin one that builds up because they cannot convert. So that's a very, very, very common side effect of those types of medications. So you'll hear about ACE inhibitors uh, being used a lot because of course, blood high blood pressure is something that's somewhat common. And you'll hear about this side effect when they're taking ACE inhibitors uh, a lot. This will be probably one of the um, most common side effects that they'll complain of. So should you know that? You should. Am I gonna test you on it? No, not really, but you should know about this process and where ACE inhibitors are acting and what kind of side effects you might see from it. Or at least it'll make sense later on when you start learning more and more about these drugs. Uh, it'll kind of make sense that these are going to be some of the side effects. So FYI, good stuff to know. Okay, so let's go back into here a little bit. As we said, of course, uh, the kidney's main function is to regulate the composition of blood and remove waste products from the body. But of course, as I just mentioned, they're going to help with the um, pH of the blood, the nitrogenous waste from protein metabolism. Remember, uh, the nitrogenous waste starts out as ammonia, which then has to get converted to urea through the urea cycle. Uh, and then the urea is eliminated from the, by the kidneys. And then of course, ADH and aldosterone are acting at the level of the kidney, specifically at the level of the nephron, <laughs> even more specifically uh, at the level of those tubules of the nephron that are going to allow for water or salt absorption which is gonna change the amount of water in the blood, which is gonna change blood volume. Here's another thing that people don't necessarily understand. Most people, at least starting out in anatomy, they know that um, vitamin D is produced by the body. However, it is in a form that is not usable, but the skin can help with vitamin D becoming in its active form, in its usable form, 
with the help of UV radiation from the sun. So the sun helps to convert vitamin D that's in our skin that is not in an active form and put it into an active form, makes it usable, which is why we do need ex <clears throat> exposure to sunlight about 45 minutes a week is sufficient, but we do need that exposure to sunlight for that to happen. However, the, the kidneys also have this ability to synthesize this active form of vitamin D, which is kind of good. Uh, I didn't talk about the prostaglandins too much. That's taking it to uh, another step, a little too far. Uh, but I did mention a little bit with erythropoietin. P-O-P-O-I-E. Yeah, T-I-N. Okay, good. That's all right. Basic functional unit of the kidney is the nephron. Remember, you'll hear me say the nephron is the parenchyma. It is the functional unit of the kidney. That's where the filtration occurs, gets the stuff out that we want to get rid of, but we also lose a lot of stuff. So we do have the ability to reabsorb stuff. That's the tubular absorption. Moving things that we lost and bringing them back into the blood. However, there's still that slight ability to do some more filtration, except in this case, we'd call it secretion, where it's going the opposite direction from the blood into the tubules. So things that didn't get completely filtered out in the glomerulus and collected in the Bowman's capsule, we still have the ability to take those out of the blood and move them into the tubules. So you can kind of imagine where those um, efferent arterioles are in contact <clears throat> with parts of the tubules, like the proximal convoluted tubule, for instance, <clears throat> we can see an exchange, stuff coming that we lost that we want to absorb back into the blood and stuff that's still in the blood that we want to get rid of. It can still happen. They can still have that exchange in that part of the tubule. So kind of, kind of uh, makes sense. And Again, I kind of want you to remember way back in the first couple of weeks, I talked about transport of materials, transport of materials across membranes. And I said, there's two basic types, passive transport and active transport. Active transport requires some energy input, but passive transport does not. And you'll remember passive transport as being diffusion where you put enough particles on one side of a membrane, if they're small enough, they're gonna follow their concentration gradient and move to the opposite side until the concentrations are even. You'll remember osmosis, the passive movement of water across a selectively permeable membrane from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration. But then there was another one, another type of transport called filtration. And this is happening here in the kidneys. There is no energy that is pushing these particles through those fenestrations, through those little openings. It is simply driven by the uh, blood pressure, the pressure of the blood moving through. So that's the easiest way to, to think about that. It is the blood pressure that's forcing those particles and other substances through those fenestrations, through those little openings. I said before, um, of all the things that gets reabsorbed, water, we, absorb, we reabsorb a huge amount of water because we lose so much of it. We lose a lot of water in that process of filtering through our uh, glomerulus, the glomeruli, the kidneys, that we have to reabsorb most of it. About 95% does get reabsorbed. There's still a lot of water that goes out in urine, as we'll see in just a little bit, but most of it, thankfully, does not. Uh, let's see. I think that was good with that. I'm not going to get into the vasorecta. That's a little bit more than we need. Okay, this is these areas here. These couple of slides are the beginning of the the complicated physiology. Actually describing which part of each of these tubes, whether it's the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, the thick 
loop of Henle, the thin loop of Henle ascending or descending, or the distal convoluted tubules, it's saying which of these areas specifically are for reabsorption of things. And so that's the stuff that I think is a little beyond the scope of this course. Uh, so I'm just, like I said, touching the surface of it. That's the stuff that I'd go into more in the advanced anatomy. Talked about aldosterone, the importance of aldosterone. Yeah, uh, I talked about atrial natriuretic pep, uh, peptide or atrial natriuretic hormone, excuse me, a little bit ago, but uh, I'm not going to go into its role here too much. Okay, so this is what we'd expect uh, the physiology of urine to look like. The, the, the composition of urine after the result of all of this physiology is what I should say. 95% of urine is made up of water. Now, again, we're talking under normal circumstances. The nitrogenous waste, that's that urea that we are getting rid of. Electrolytes, and I know you're thinking, but wait, I thought we need electrolytes. Well, we do need some, and we are gonna lose some. In some cases, we might even lose some glucose. Uh, toxins, pigments, hormones, yes, yes, yes. Abnormal constituents means just that, under normal, conditions, we don't see a lot of red blood cells. We don't see a lot of white blood cells. We don't see a lot of breakdown of other things. Um, like, I don't know, other hormones, like vanilla mandelic acid or something like that. But we could help identify disease processes by seeing some of these abnormal constituents in, in the urine. This is why it might seem kind of benign, but this is why um, we take those urine specimens. We can get a lot of information from them. What a person is losing and what they're not. What's in there that shouldn't be, what sh shouldn't be in there that is. What's in there that shouldn't be, and what should be in there that isn't, yes. Oh, good, okay. I'm a little bit ahead of schedule, maybe. Talked about electrolytes already. Uh, let's see. Total body water in a, in a person. Um, it actually leans more towards the 75% most of the time. So typically what you'll see in most books, they'll say between uh, 60 and 80%, 50 and 75%. So it's really actually a little more towards the 75% of total body weight, but it depends on a lot depends on fat, and a lot depends on muscle. You see differences in there as well. Okay, now this is kind of interesting. Let's see if I can see, there we go. Let's look at it this way. So here's a cell, right? A cell has that nucleus in the middle that we see there, plus it has other things. We know there's organelles floating around in there. But most of what makes up the interior of a cell is cytoplasm. Cytoplasm is the liquidy, sticky stuff that makes up most of the volume that's inside of a cell. And most of cytoplasm is made up of water. We call that an intracellular compartment. It's inside of the cells. This is where we find most of the water in our body is actually inside of our cells. Extracellular uh, compartments, oops, I might as well go right, oh no, I'll go right here. Extracellular compartments include places like the blood or the joint spaces or those areas uh, in the brain and spinal cord where the fluid circulates or the fluid that moves around white blood cells. So if we look at, back to here, plasma, remember, blood is made up of two components. It is made up of a fluid component called plasma and a, a solid component called formed elements like red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets. And the plasma, even though it's about 
55% of our blood is made up of the liquid part. Somewhere around 90 to 92% is made up of the plasma is made up of water. So almost half of your blood is made up of water in the plasma part. The lymphatic fluid, the, lymph the lymphatic system is the system that helps to move around white blood cells and debris and filters out a lot of uh, things like bacteria and virally infected cells. And the fluid that is found in the lymphatic system is called lymph. That fluid is made up of mostly water. Uh, sir, you said it's called, uh, it's called lymph? Yes, lymph, L-Y-M-P-H. Remember, the lymphatic system is a one-way fluid movement system, whereas uh, the cardiovascular system is a circular system that moves fluids around, moves blood around. Uh, the lymphatic system is a one-way system that collects fluid uh, at the capillary end, also collects debris and broken down cells and virally infected cells and bacteria and garbage and takes that collection of stuff and filters it out through things like lymph nodes or lymphatic tissue, like the spleen or the tonsils, the adenoids, the appendix, the pyres patches. And then that fluid gets dumped back in with the blood uh, in the vena cava just before entering the heart. So it's more of a one-way system. And there's a lot of fluid that is inside of the cells in that cytoplasm. A lot of that is water, but there's also a certain amount of fluid around the cells on the outside of the cells that is mostly made up of water. And that is called the interstitial fluid. That's the fluid that sits around cells. And that fluid, the interstitial fluid is almost identical to the plasma. The things that you'd find in the plasma are the things that you're gonna find in interstitial fluid and, and vice versa. They're almost identical because the, you know, the plasma is delivering things as, as blood and it's delivering things to cells. And those things are gonna move from the plasma to the interstitial fluid, from the interstitial fluid into the cells. So it kind of makes sense that it's almost the same composition. So, so the, do the, sorry, do the extracellular fluid, um, it's extra, extracellular fluid on the outside and it moves in through the semifrontal membrane and converts over into so it's the same thing, but it just turns, once it get inside, it turns into interstitial fluid. What, this is the interstitial fluid. Sorry, the interstitial fluid is still on the outside of the cells. I hope I was saying that right. Let me, try, let me say this again. Should maybe, well, maybe I won't draw a picture. Okay. There is the fluid that sits around the cells. That's the interstitial fluid. That fluid is still outside of the cells, but the composition of the interstitial fluid is almost the same as the plasma. Because as blood gets pumped around to deliver nutrients throughout the body, there's going to be a shifting of some of those nutrients from the plasma, from the blood, to the fluid that sits around the cells. And then those particles move from the interstitial fluid into the cell. That does include water to a certain extent, because of course, you know, we're going to have water moving in and out of the cells at certain times. But that's why the interstitial fluid is 
almost identical in the make and makeup as the plasma because they're almost the same. I guess that's sort of redundant when I say it like that. Let me see. Let me try this. So here we have a cell, throw a nucleus in there, some uh, DNA in the middle there, and we'll put the cytoplasm inside of the cell. And cytoplasm is a liquidy substance that is mostly made up of water. And then we have fluid around that, that is the interstitial fluid. And then we have blood. So here's a blood vessel, which is made up of formed elements like red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, but also water. And again, the plasma is 55% plasma to 45% formed elements, and 91% of the plasma is water, so almost half of your blood is water. So when the blood delivers nutrients, let's see, we will pick green as a nice nutrient color. Whatever this nutrient happens to be, going to move from the blood to the interstitial fluid. So now the nutrients are here, again, whatever these nutrients might happen to be. And then they're gonna move from here into the cells. So you can see how, uh, let's see, purple. You can see how the fluid portion of blood, the plasma, is going to be very similar to the fluid around the cells, the interstitial fluid, because they're going to contain some of the same things. And then, of course, we can have some water move into the cell, some water move out of the cell, depending upon osmotic pressure. If remember, os water is going to move wherever there's more uh, solid particles. So this is how the interstitial fluid is really, really close to the composition of plasma. And that's why. And of course, there's a lot of interstitial fluid sitting around the cells, which means there's a lot of water sitting around the cells, which means when it comes to our body composition, most of our water is found intracellular. Most of the water in our body is found inside of our cells. But look how much is found extracellular, extracellularly as interstitial fluid. That's a big chunk of the pie as compared to the plasma, which you, know, you got to think there's a lot of blood in us. So there's a lot of plasma. And then transcellular is the the, move, the constant little movement back and forth. And then of course, uh, the lymph. Or um, let's also include the transcellular, these other fluids. We know what cerebrospinal fluid is. We've talked about that before. That's the fluid that circulates around the brain and spinal cord. Uh, we talked about synovial fluid. That's the fluid that's in those joint spaces where we need that extra lubrication like if you think of your knee or your knuckles, for instance. The humors of the eye include the vitreous humor, which is the thick jelly-like fluid that helps to keep the shape of the eyeball, and the aqueous humor, which circulates and brings nutrients um, from behind the iris to the front compartment, to the anterior 
uh, compartment in the eye behind the cornea. Yes, behind the cornea, posterior to the cornea, but anterior to the iris. And then that aqueous humor drains out through the sides. I think I talked about that a little bit back uh, a couple of weeks ago. So this, um, this diagram really kind of gives you a good idea of where our water sits in our body, where most of it is found. But it does something else. It does it, well, not directly, I guess. One of the things this demonstrates is that we cannot change the viscosity of blood. If the viscosity is the thickness of blood. If we changed that, that would change the amount of water that was in the blood. And if we change the amount of water in the blood or the, the amount of solid particles that are in the water in the blood, that's going to change the amount of solid particles that are in the interstitial fluid, which is either, which is going to draw water either out of the blood or out of the cells. So again, when patients are taking blood thinners, we don't actually thin their blood because if we did, it would change the amount of solid particles that are in that uh, the liquid component of both the plasma and then there, thereafter the interstitial fluid, which is then going to have a direct result on the movement of water into or out of a cell, which could be dangerous, which is why we don't do that. We don't change the viscosity of blood. We don't make it thinner. Okay, I just talked about intracellular. Oh, well, here's, here's what I was just saying. Uh, plasma and interstitial fluid are almost identical. I just said, all right, where are we? Oh, kind of, kind of close here. Mm, yeah. Talk about that a little bit. How do we get water into the body? Obviously, we drink it. Now, we don't just drink it as water. If you have a soda, you'll notice that your soda is made up of a lot of water. If you look at the ingredients, if you drink orange juice, a lot of that uh, liquid part of orange juice is water. If you drink coffee or tea, a lot of that is water. Uh, so actually, most of what we're drinking is water. But when we eat foods, we actually eat a lot of water. I know that sounds weird. And it's not just in the form of things like popsicles or ice cubes, but when we eat things like a banana, a banana has a huge amount of water in it, which is good. And we see that if you've ever had banana chips, you can get these as snacks, right? These dehydrated banana chips. If you took a banana, cut it up and made your own banana chips, <clears throat> one thing you would find, <clears throat> excuse me, is how much uh, they shrink, how much everything shrinks down. And that's because it loses all that water. So everything just sort of shrinks together. The downside to that is when you eat those banana chips, you have to eat a lot more banana chips to feel full. If you eat just a regular banana, not only are you getting all the goodness of banana, but you're also getting all the goodness of water, which is making you feel fuller. So if you eat the dehydrated banana chips, in order to feel just as full, you have to eat more of those chips, which actually increases more sugar going into the body, which is why those aren't really a healthy choice. I know people like to think stuff like that's healthy, but it's really not. But we do, we eat a lot, we eat a lot of water. How does water leave the body then? Well, obviously in urine, a lot of it leaves that way. We breathe out a lot of water. You can definitely see this when it's cold outside and you can see your breath, but even when it's not, you can go up to like a mirror in the bathroom and breathe on it and it fogs up the mirror. And the reason it does this is because it's the water droplets are condensing. 
So we actually breathe out a certain amount of water as well. We sweat out water, you know this, if you've ever worked out at all, you know that you sweat out some water that way. Even if you're not working out, uh, you're still going to be sweating a little bit in places, some places more than others. And then finally in feces, there's actually water lost in that. And of course you, you would say, well, yeah, with diarrhea, you lose a lot of water. True, but even um, in normal bowel movements, there is a lot of water in that feces. So not to mention, um, they didn't include here, but also mucus. When you cough, sneeze, uh, when you uh, have a bowel movement, you're losing mucus. You're losing cells that produce mucus as well. So those goblin cells. You urinate, you're going to lose some of that mucus lining, so it has to be recreated again. But that's small amount. When you cry, uh, tears are constantly washing over your eyes to help flush away things, help bring nutrients to the cornea, and help to lubricate the eye. And they drain into the nasal lacrimal uh, canal, nasal, nasal lacrimal duct into the nose. And then, of course, you end up swallowing most of that. So there's lots of ways that we lose water. Can we absorb water through our skin? Very, very, very little. Very little amount of water can be absorbed through our skin, but it actually can. Let me check here and make sure. Okay, oh, there we are. See here, uh, they're talking about the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And they actually spelled renin wrong. It's R-E-N-I-N. And I still just call it the renin angiotensin system because, well, it also works to increase peripheral resistance. And that's kind of important. It's not just about aldosterone. And some of that is demonstrated here, but I've already talked about that. I'm running a little out of time, but I think I'm pretty much done. Uh, let's see. Vomiting, diarrhea, these can lose, you can lose a lot of water, but you can also lose a lot of electrolytes in these things. Lose a lot of sugar. If a kid is, if a baby, as I say kid, if a baby is vomiting has diarrhea for a, a day, day and a half, they're already going to be really, really low on those things. Okay. Uh, Talked a little bit about some of that stuff already. Uh, all right, I think I'm going to just finish up here very quickly. We talked about pH before. Uh, we know that <clears throat> the pH of blood is right around 7.4. Intracellular, it's a little bit more acidic. It's right around uh, neutral, but acidic compared to uh, blood. So if blood's right around 7.4. Anything less than that is going to be acidic. Anything greater than that is going to be alkalotic. You can see at the bottom there. And finally, the pH scale, as we've seen it in the past, as the number gets lower, there's an increase in protons, the hydrogen ions. That becomes more acidic <clears throat> and alkaline or basic as the number gets higher. Um, remember, this is just a scale, just like when you weigh yourself on a scale. When we talk about something being acidic or basic, we are usually talking about it in reference to something else. So just like the scale that you weigh yourself on at home, if I say a person weighed 100 pounds, you would say, well, that's not a lot. Well, if it's a three-year-old, then it's a huge amount. If it's a six-foot-tall adult, then it is kind of low. 
So it's going to be relative to something else. Same thing here. When we talk about acidity or, or alkalinity, it is in reference to something else. So that's where I wanted to finish and I got us there. Okay, just about in time. So there we are. Skipped over just a couple of things, but they weren't terribly uh, pressing. So I'm not gonna be too concerned with that. Uh, sir. Yes. Uh, don't you use the pH scale for ABGs as well, like artificial bug glasses and stuff like that? Arterial blood gases? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> for, for those who don't know, first of all, uh oh. Is that not going away? For those who don't know, normally <clears throat> when you think of somebody having their blood drawn, go to a phlebotomist and they get a they stick a vein and draw out some tubes of blood. Uh, that's a vena puncture. That is taking blood from a vein. Sometimes we want to take blood from an artery specifically to look at those carbon dioxide and oxygen levels that are in that arterial blood. So in that case, the patient would have what's called an ABG, arterial blood gas. Now, why would pH matter there? Well, let's look at the main buffer in the blood is of course carbon, not carbon dioxide, bicarbonate. However, bicarbonate is created by carbon dioxide. That's the main way that carbon dioxide travels in the blood. So it's absolutely going to play a part in the pH of the blood, making sure that it maintains that uh, 7.4, a little more alkaline uh, pH. So yes. Any other questions? Is, that, is anyone still there? Yes, right here. Take that as a yes. Okay. So in just a few minutes, uh, you will have accessibility to quiz number, no, quiz week 10, week 10 quiz, that quiz number 10, it's week 10 quiz. Uh, that is over the respiratory system and the gastrointestinal system. So it's 20 questions, multiple choice, and you have an hour once you begin. It's timed at 60 minutes. And it must be completed by four o'clock. So if you started at two o'clock, you can be done, you have till three o'clock, uh, that, yeah, that 60 minute time frame. If you started at 2.30, 60 minutes later is 3.30, et cetera. But I, I strongly suggest you get started on it kind of soon. Make sure you get it done. Um, I did find one question yesterday where I had made an error. I put the, uh, the wrong answer in as a right answer and someone caught that. So I did make that change. So that shouldn't be a problem. But- Dr. Stewart, I really, yes. I didn't know we had a quiz there. It was every day. Well, the good news is you can start at three o'clock. So you have an hour to study for it. And you said respiratory and what else? Gastrointestinal system. Okay. Is that a study guide for this quiz? Or? This is the stuff from last week. From the lecture that we talked about? Yes. Okay. I didn't know about this quiz today either. You should have a quiz every week. The only times I didn't have a quiz was either when you were having a test or like the week after the test because we didn't cover any new material. So there was nothing to quiz you on. So pretty much each time we have a lecture, it's good 
to um, constantly be taking your notes as you're talking, because most likely we'll probably have a quiz on the things that you elaborate on. Correct. The next, the following week. And the that's, following week. That's how the, the syllabus was set up, where there was a quiz every week. And then I changed those quizzes uh, to my quizzes because they were bad quizzes. And then there were quizzes I eliminated because again, on an exam, there wasn't one on an exam day, but like, I think the one that came right after the last exam, I didn't, I just got rid of that quiz and didn't create a new one because there was nothing to quiz you on because we didn't really cover any new material. So I thought it was unfair to quiz you on something without covering the material first. But otherwise, yeah, we've pretty much had a quiz every week. And I, I changed them because normally the ones I had given before, um, I would give like several days for it to be due. And I was uh, advised that I should not be doing that, that I need to set a time limit for it to be done that day. So I found that the last hour of class is the best time to do that. Because rather than give a quiz at three o'clock, people could say, well, I had to go to work because class is only supposed to go to three. So I had to leave and go to work so I didn't have time to take the quiz. So I scheduled for the last hour. But I do give two hours in or in that time frame to have it done. So even though the quiz should be available right now, that is. Dr. Sturgeon, is this week nine or week 10 quiz? This is week, this is week 10. Oh, shoot, that's the wrong place. This is week 10. So if you look in the modules, it should read week 10 respiratory and gastrointestinal systems quiz. You can see that. Showing up for me. Let me see if I can click on it and it's available from 2 p.m. today. Yeah. So it should be good. Good to go. Dr. Sturgeon, can you eliminate next week's quiz so we can study for our final? No, next week's a good quiz. The urinary system quiz, nutrition quiz, those are good. And didn't you have time to study for your final? Yeah, Don't I've... you have a review online that I sent you a link to a couple of weeks ago? Yes, but we have yeah. other, other quizzes as well. I know, and haven't I eliminated half of your homework and discussion assignments? Yes, I know all that. So I took that into consideration. We are allowed to leave now? Yes. Thank you, let me go yes. I'm going to uh, end this now, and then I'm gonna come back on because for some reason my screen is somewhat frozen. So it's not allowing me to stop, just end the recording. So I'm just gonna to have to end the Zoom meeting and then I will restart it. So I'll, I'll be here in the background if you need anything. So let me see if I can end it. It will allow me to end it. No, it won't. I don't know why, but it's not allowing me to do anything at the moment. Okay, so let me try ending it this way. I don't know it won't work either, will it? Yeah, I'm gonna end it this way. This.
Sarah, you're frozen. Okay, I think I'm back now. Oh, let me just stop recording now.